From the Homestead Studios in Santa Clarita, California, it's Just the Tip Stirs with Melissa Morgan. I'm going to the Salem Bitch Trials. If you've got a tip for Melissa, something you told yourself you didn't really see, but you did. A contact that might help solve a case. That match.com date you ditched before the appetizer showed up because he kept quoting Edgar Allan Poe out of context. Anything, tell us about it by calling the Tipster hotline at 832-TIPSTER. That's 832-847-7837 or send an email to jttipsters at gmail.com. And now here's your host. She believes that revenge is a dish best served cold with strawberries, caramel sauce, and sprinkles. Melissa Morgan. More cowbell? That sounded like I was under duress. I think I was just trying to hurry really fast and say it. Cause... <laughs> Poor cowbell! I think I think I might have been too a little it, bit. It, yeah. yeah, we were a little a little long long in the intro. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, a little bit long in the intro. Yeah, so I just sometimes I would just like to say that if I were on a Match dot com date and he began quoting Edgar Allan Poe out of context, yeah. I would ask him to marry me right then. Um, because <laughs> well, maybe you would. I but would. Yes, I yeah. have one of my favorite gifts from my mother ever was the complete works of Edgar Allan Poe, and it was she got it at a um, like a library sale or something. It was an old oh yeah, and then later on, like a few years after that, she got me a brand new version of it. So I have oh, two really? <laughs> two versions of of the complete works of Edgar Allan Poe. Who, by the way, I've been fascinated with since I was eight. No, I knew that. I just, it's just, uh, you are fascinated with Edgar Allan Poe. I it's am. Good. You have a, somebody gave you a, comp- like a bust of his head. Yeah, that, no, I bought that. Oh, that's right. <laughs> the eyes lit up. Oh, that's right. For Halloween, it turned red. <laughs> that's right. He, he that's... Is, he's batter operated. Yeah, uh, it's, it's huge. It's a really nice, um, like, Oh, what's that melamine or whatever, that weird hard plastic yes, he's made out of that? Yes. He looks like he's concrete. Right. Yeah, it's really cool. I do have to say I am a big fan of his. Since uh, I was a kid, some people in the Midwest will remember, and, and different names across the country, um, it was Frisch's Big Boy, where I came from. It was yes. Azores or something. It's Azars in like Azars. Colorado and some What other, are the other ones? There's Bob's Big Boy, of course, Bob's, which is the right, original duh. out here. Right. And uh, and then there's yeah there was Azars there was um, uh, the one Frisch's and there's one other I think I know I can't remember I can't, I can't remember. remember the other one but um, so they used to print a little magazine for kids that you could color and stuff and I was bored with the coloring part because I was never really like a great stay in the lines person I'm sure that's shocking but they had a little bio about Edgar Allan Poe, and I cut it You're out. You're kidding me, no, really? A little bio, and I was like so fascinated by him, and I cut it out, and I kept that fucking thing in my wallet till college. Oh my God. It, it I can't believe it lasted that long. It was such a, you know, like a multicolored little newspaper. You I know? remember then when, you know, Bob's Big Boy used to have the little newspaper for kids. Oh, okay. It was like a, a booklet. It was a like book, a, yeah. It was on newsprint. But right. It was like, and they had like a section where you could do coloring. Yes, exactly. And they had little fun facts about stuff. Yes. So I guess they had, they had a little, <laughs> a little bio. Big Boy. I mean, uh, <laughs> Frisch's, Frisch's Big Boy. boy. <laughs> a little thing about Edgar Allan Poe when I was eight. And I'm like, this is my, he is my spirit animal, which okay. I just have always been a huge fan. But so if, if someone in a, a Match.com date, I don't know if, if you're saying that because you're planning on divorcing me and no, you think I need... Oh, okay. It just I sounded creepy was... to me, but I <laughs> forgot that you're such a big fan. <laughs> you forgot who you're married to? That someone who would be like, tell me more, Blanche. Yeah, really. I'm like so thrilled with... I would be thrilled with that. But so yeah, that's... I Your intros are always... One of the joys of my life, producer Mark. Thank you. Uh, that may be a little extreme, but uh, even though we got a, a wonderful one star review from someone who says we're um, obnoxious, arrogant, and not funny. So, uh, well, I work really hard at being arrogant, obnoxious, and not funny. We don't I, have to work hard. I work really hard. I feel hard like it's in it. your DNA. Oh, no, thanks. no, no. You don't have to work. Okay, now we're getting a divorce. Goodbye. Okay, goodbye. Click. Yeah. No, it's. Uh, we- <laughs> Okay, we got we got to ignore the bad reviews that's, because that's the Doppler effect of the is that right of the hang up oh, thing I, see. I was doing. Yeah, I know I'm not good at that. So what I would like to do is say thank you to the the wonderful, kind, generous, thoughtful, well written reviews that we got recently. One from Ocean Girl, one from Tate Surge. I don't know if that's like a, two names or a nickname. Uh, Poet Amelie, Pennies from Heaven. LCB18, 
and Chris MG, and they gave us the kind of reviews that make your heart sing. It's like the people that that get you and and get you in a way that you don't even get yourself. They say the nicest things. They're you know coming from their perspective. Of, oh, yeah, but a couple of them were really like, wow. I yeah. think they really get us. Right. That, right. That's the thing that is so shocking is that sometimes complete strangers say things that make you think, oh. They really, they get it. They get what we're saying and what we're doing. And and even though we're arrogant and not funny, they still get us. So you know, that wasn't very funny. Okay, all right. Just... So I also wanted to say to Tipster Crystal, thank you for sending us a really fascinating email about a case from Colorado that um, I'll be looking into because it's a, a well-known case. And I she gave me a piece of information I had never heard. And I am excited about doing that one. And I also just want to let tipster christina know that we're still working on the case of the missing person from north carolina and that is a really interesting one also he's been missing since 2008 and the details are really um fascinating and i have to say you know dealing this week with law enforcement from uh wilkesboro uh county i believe it is north carolina and from broward county florida I'm, you know, usually a little more crabby, but I'm, I've been very impressed with law enforcement agencies from both of those areas because while I haven't gotten everything I need <laughs> to cover the cases, I have gotten polite professionalism, kindness, information that, you know, I can go to a, a different um, source. And, and I'm just grateful for that. There are just so many agencies who won't give you the time of day, <laughs> won't won't say yay or nay, just won't say anything. So when I'm, you know, a law enforcement agency is open to hearing what I'm saying, uh, open to answering what I'm asking for, it's it's a, a beautiful thing. So we do have a couple of interesting cases that will be coming up from different parts of uh, the country that I, you know, I'm, these are fascinating ones. And the case today is one of those things that I am not a big believer in that there's just evil. I just, I don't, I don't believe that. I, I think that it has to come from a place. I don't, I I don't have an answer for you. I don't know if it's you're born evil or your surroundings and your upbringing make you evil. I don't have the answer and I don't think there's anything that black and white, quite frankly, but I just don't believe that there's just evil. And yet sometimes a case with really no definitive answer can make you think maybe this is just evil. Maybe this person is just evil. And I think the best way that I have been able to do research on this case is to just keep going back to a quote from J.C. Dugard. Uh, If you remember, she was kidnapped from outside of her home waiting for her bus in Northern California, and she was kept by a man and his wife in a, you know, makeshift shed in the backyard, and she gave birth to one or two of his kids. And, you know, he went to a university, might have been Berkeley, um, and a, um, a Berkeley safety officer, a female safety officer recognized JC and asked her name and she wouldn't tell them her real name at first. And then she did. And they, she was rescued 11, 12 years later. So this is one of those things where JC Dugard says, this isn't who they are. It's only what happened to them. It's hard to remember that sometimes when you hear what happens to two young, beautiful, and completely innocent girls enjoying their life. And if anyone could understand what happened to them, and not why, but what happened to them, it would be J.C. Dugard. And this isn't who they are. It's just what happened to them. This case has a lot of names that sound familiar, that sound uh, alike. So I'm going to ask you to hang with me and hopefully I can uh, make it clear 
and hopefully producer Mark can ask questions if there are things that sound repetitive or overlapping. It's also going to go in a different bit of a timeline, so I'm going to ask you to hang with me there too. So June 8th of 2008, a beautiful summer day in Oklahoma, two young girls are out of school and their best friends, Taylor Placker, who's 13, and Skyla Whitaker, who is 11. And their best friends, and their town is so small, Walitka, Oklahoma, that there's a combination fifth and sixth grade class. The town has approximately a thousand people. It's very small. Pretty much everyone knows everyone. You live next door, no matter how big your farm is. All, everyone is your neighbor. So Taylor and Skyla had had a sleepover the night before. They'd painted their nails. Um, as young girls do, they'd given themselves um, temporary tattoos with markers. Uh, Taylor actually had the name Skyla written on her tummy with a marker when she was found. And these two beautiful young girls were walking down a very remote country road in their town, and they were going to a creek, to a bridge, a local bridge, Bad Creek Bridge, and they were going to look for shells and pebbles. And they knew that they'd have to go through some weeds, you know, to get to the riverbank, but they could, they could do it. They were going to be, they were going to be fine. And it's a half a mile, half a mile from Taylor's home down a very, very remote stretch of a almost dirt road, really. It doesn't even look very well paved, very country road. It got to be dark, and Taylor's mother sent a text saying, you girls need to come home now, and she didn't get a response. So Taylor's grandfather went looking for them, and found both of them off the side of the road, shot 13 times. 13 times? 13 times. Oh, my. Now, I can't find any information if it was one was shot seven times and one was shot six times, or they both weren't shot 16 or 13 times each, but there were 13 shots in the chest and the head. One uh, underneath one of the girl's shorts, which leads investigators to believe that the shorts had been removed and then placed back on the bodies after they were shot. And there's other information we'll get to in a little bit that backs that up that they were sexually assaulted, or at least Taylor was. So the grandfather finds the two beautiful young girls, his granddaughter and his granddaughter's best friend. And in his own words, he lets out a deafening scream. He said he doesn't remember hearing anything. It was like he was in a vacuum and he screams. And it sets off the biggest investigation in Oklahoma history. This small town realizes that they cannot solve a case like this, and they really try hard, but they bring in the Oklahoma Bureau of Investigations, um, you know, a larger state agency, and they really go all out. But this is one of those cases where you can't do a victimology because a, an 11 and a 13-year-old girl in a small town, two, two best friends that are, you know, two girl best friends who are having a sleepover and enjoying a summer day, there's no victimology that explains who could have killed them. There's, you know, there are many people who, who die who are innocent, but you can't, you can't find something in their lifestyle that would have led them to be murdered, murdered in cold blood. Executed. Yeah, executed. 
you can't find something that an 11 year old and a 13 year old did. They weren't, you know, courting men online. They weren't pretending to be over age. They were age appropriate, beautiful little girls enjoying a summer day looking for fucking rocks and shells. And they were, yeah, executed. That's a great way to put it, producer Mark. So they figure out that these are, the shots are from a, a Glock, a 40 millimeter Glock. And they send out 60 letters to known Glock owners and ask them to bring their guns in to be tested. These are all Glock owners in the area. Yes. I yeah. Yes. And they, they do. The 60 people contacted, obviously, you know, they are law abiding citizens and they bring their guns in and there's, they cannot match, they can't match any gun that they know of to these shell casings that were around the girls' bodies. So it is a big mystery in the state of Oklahoma and it is a bad one. It's a really, really bad one. And this story is covered. I found things in the Washington Post. Uh, People Magazine uh, was covered on a couple of ID network shows, Murder Comes to Town and Shadow of Doubt. And we'll get to the Shadow of Doubt episode in a moment. Uh, but the thing I found that does, I feel like, the most comprehensive coverage is an online news source called Tulsa World. And it's their their journalists are phenomenal and it's just really well done the way that they cover this case and it was a big mystery unfortunately for three years so now we're going to go forward in time and july of 2011 this these two murders are still unsolved and in the same small town a young girl named ashley taylor Again, the, the two girls that were murdered are Taylor Placker and Skyla Whitaker. And Ashley Taylor is a young woman who's engaged to a man named Kevin Joe Sweat. Now, they had met in high school in this very small town. And at the time, Kevin had worked at a McDonald's. And Ashley was at home with a friend and she had a crush on Kevin and she and her friend were using the Ouija board and asked the Ouija board to allow them to fly over to Kevin's house and see him as young girls do when they play with a Ouija board. It's a fun, scary, kind of fun thing to do. And 15 minutes later, Kevin called Ashley and until her death, she thought that the Ouija board had something to do with bringing them together. But I think it was a very small town, not a lot of people in your age to date. And Kevin called Ashley and said, I've, you know, had a crush on you for a while. Would you like to go out? So they started dating. Now, they were together for four years. So they were together from 2007 to 2011. So it was before the two young girls were murdered in Walitka. So Kevin and Ashley are together, probably not in the most favor of Ashley's parents, but they, you know, put up with it. And she tells her parents in July of 2011, Kevin and I are going to New Orleans. We're going to get married. Now, they had been engaged since 2009, but it was a secret. And they had wanted to live a life on the run, even though Ashley was not a lawbreaker. They wanted to be nomads, and they were really into the movie Natural Born Killers. Oh, that's not a good start. Not not a good start at all. Uh, Ashley enjoyed the movie because they were roaming around a lot, and Kevin enjoyed the movie because I think it um, gave him ideas of what he could do to become infamous. Oh, boy. So they were supposed to leave for New Orleans July 15th of 2011. Um, it takes a couple of weeks, but Ashley, and she's, you know, she's over age. She's 20, 21. Uh, no, let's see. 21, 22. She's over age, and her parents finally 
when they can't get a hold of her for a few days, go over to the apartment that she shared with Kevin. And Kevin was trying to flee. And they stop him and say, um, where, where's Ashley? Did you go to New Orleans and get married? And he said, yeah, um, we got in a fight and we were on uh, U.S. Highway 75 and she got out and just started walking. Okay. Ashley's parents are really smart and do their due diligence and show up at Kevin's now employer, which is the Subway sandwich shop, and say, has he been gone for the last two weeks? They were like, no, he hasn't missed one shift. He's been here every day. So he's not a five beta kappa. No, no. But he could have gotten away with what he did if he hadn't said to Ashley's parents, oh, well, your daughter's missing, so now I guess I'm going to be blamed for those two girls that were murdered in Walitka also, right? Oh, my God. So he's really stupid. Um, I don't, I don't know how to answer that because they do testing later on because he claims several things and none of those things were found to be true by clinicians. And even if he wasn't smart or was smart, I think he just wanted to make a splash. And that I think might be the definition of evil if, oh. if you're looking. So, yeah, so he may have just, may have wanted to be caught because he may, like you say, may may have wanted to be famous. I think, I think that, I find people who post blogs of what they do, real narcissists, like I, I love social media for the most part. There's a rampant amount of narcissism. I mean, let's be honest, if you're posting pictures of yourself all the time and and hoping for approbation or feedback from people. And I get it. We all have, you know, um, egos and self-esteem issues. And but there's a there's a lot of rampant narcissism. I find people who write personal blogs about how they got up and had eggs and bacon and took a shit at 1015. I don't give a shit and no one else does either. So he was very uh, prolific. Uh, he had different aliases, and he would write blogs about his life as if anyone cared. Oh, so he had, did he have multiple blogs? Yes. Oh. And and these came into play a little later because he said things like, um, I need to get away from my girlfriend. I need to get out of town. Um, I I need to pay off my bills and get out of here for once and for all. Getting engaged was the worst thing I've ever done biggest mistake of my life, all of these things that Ashley knew nothing about, I'm sure. So a few weeks after Ashley's parents are not letting up because they know he knows where their daughter is and it isn't on Highway 75 uh, coming back from New Orleans, they find a smoldering burn pile in Kevin Sweat's father's property. In the burn pile is um, Ashley's bone fragments, her glasses, her sandals, and the engagement ring that he had given her. Uh, who found this? Um, the police after uh, Ashley's parents said, please check out his father's property. Oh, God. And the police find Glock 40 millimeter shell casings in the burn pile with Ashley and they match the shell casings that killed Taylor and Skyla. Man. Now, Kevin Sweat, when I say wants to be famous, he, I've really never heard of someone who gives so many stories about what happened. He said that he was driving down the road on June 8th of 2008 and two monsters came out of the woods and he panicked and reached behind him and got his Glock, but he also got a 22 caliber. So he shot the girls with two different guns. And there is, like the television show, a shadow of doubt because, not that he did it, because he did, but that someone else may have been involved because there was DNA found 
on the girls that did not match him. And Taylor Placker had been more violently, um, more violently abused. I'm trying to think of the nicest way to say it. It turns out that apparently Skyla had tried to run and Taylor was protecting her. And she got the worst of, of what happened to, to them both. And they realized that Kevin Sweat is the, in their mind, only suspect because he knew how they were laid out and what happened and what order. Not only the, the bullet casings that match. Okay, so I got just one question about that we need to go back. I just have one thing that I'm not clear on. What, they originally wrote to 60 people who they knew owned Glocks, right? Yes. All from the area, right? Yes. So why was he missed? Why didn't they get his Glock? That's a great question, Producer Mark. He had purchased his gun, which, by the way, was never found. Uh, he had purchased his gun at a gun show, and it had previously been owned by the Baltimore State Police. Oh, wow. And they had kept shell casings because they're the police. And then they were able to match uh, the Baltimore State Police, you know, confirmed that the gun had been in their possession and that they, it had been sold at a, at a gun show. And uh, I guess to, to him, to Kevin Sweat, and they were able to match the casings. And he, you know, confirmed that he purchased the gun at a gun show. Okay, thanks. So Kevin Sweat goes from saying, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't, I don't, I don't, I've never met those two girls. I don't know who those two girls are. Um, Ashley's parents are crazy. I never said that. Well, how did Ashley end up in a burn pile on your father's property, Kevin? I don't know. I don't know. I may, I may have blacked out. I really, I really don't know. I may have blacked out. Mm -hmm. That's great. He goes from saying that he has blackouts to that uh, the fact that he is autistic. Uh, all of these things were tested <laughs> by yeah. by doctors, and it doesn't. I don't know any autistic killers. I no, don't. Me I mean, either. and what's this thing with? He says that they were monsters. Mm -hmm. He he said that he had a hallucination. Was that was he what what he was claiming? Well, he wouldn't call it that, but yes, that's you know uh, the the young girl's family members say he was setting up something for a oh an insanity mm -hmm, defense insanity plea, and it just wasn't going to work because he wasn't insane. This is the part where e evil. I I just am I'm heartbroken. We'll we'll get to what may really be a motive, not never a motive. There's never a good enough motive, but what might really have happened. They weren't monsters. He said to several different agencies, uh, law enforcement agencies, my girlfriend wanted to get married and I didn't want to, and she wouldn't take no for an answer. There's also the theory that Ashley knew that he had killed the two girls because he really can't keep his mouth shut and she had threatened to turn him in. Now that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I'm not sure what happens to him, but most every picture of him coming from the jail to any sort of court appearance, he is injured. He has black eyes, which I'm deliriously happy about. He goes from having a huge amount of kind of auburn curly hair to very shaved head, to sort of um, longer on top, shorter on the sides, dark dark hair. He he's like a chameleon, but his real self is always sort of shining through. And when I say shining, it's not a pretty shining. It's a dull, odd way that he looks. There's you know a glaze. Yeah, there's something dead inside him. There's something dead. So he alternately confesses, recants, says they were monsters. I don't know what happened. Ashley wanted to get married. I didn't. I don't know how she got burned. He said he 
slit her throat. He said he shot her. Um, Ashley's family, unfortunately, finds some pictures of him covered in blood that looks like he probably did slit her throat. And I don't know if there was just not enough left in the burn pile of her remains to to come to a, you know, a definitive way of how she, her manner of death. But she's she's gone for sure. So he had a fascination with guns, obviously, and with knives. And this particular Glock 40, the reason that they thought there were potentially two perpetrators is that there were two guns used. And then there was the, you know, the DNA found found in Taylor, who's 13 and was not sexually active, uh, didn't have a boyfriend, uh, you know, didn't, there wasn't that going on. So they're, you know, trying to figure out how this happened and if he did it alone and, or if he watched out for anyone who could have been coming and see them while one of someone else sexually assaulted the girls. I, it's, I, I can't even right now, but, but Kevin Sweat is such a narcissist that if there was someone else involved, which someone's involved somehow, whether it's, you know, someone she knew or not, he will not ever say anything <laughs> about anyone else. That is weird, man. Yeah, he's a real, he is, he is the definition of a narcissist. You, you might call him the definition of evil, which I will be honest with you, the district attorney who ended up prosecuting this, who was fairly new and not that long out of law school. She, she said that the case still affects her to this day. And, well, and how could it not? Right. And I will also tell you a really well done book written about the case by an author from Oklahoma named Faith Phillips. And it's the title is now I lay me down. And it's a, it's a really well done book. I mean, she's not a journalist, but she, she's, you know, like a fiction and nonfiction writer for young adults. And this is her, her dedication to getting all of the details in, in her book is, is really beautiful. And she believes that sometimes there's just nothing you can say, but this is evil. This is what evil is. And I'm, yeah, um, I struggle, I struggle with it a lot. I don't, I don't know. I, I tend to agree with that. I, I'm, it, when you hear something like this, that the thing that's getting me about this is that they're clearly, to me, it seems like there clearly was somebody else doing this with him. And, and yet he is so narcissistic that he doesn't want anybody else to get quote unquote credit for this. Right. And and there's somebody else out there who's at least <laughs> at least equally as evil that he, he he's letting get away with this simply so that he can get all the attention. That is that is pure evil. And I and I don't and I think that there are some people just born with it. I just think there are. Well, I understand why you think that. And and again, I'm I I cannot come down on one side. I don't, the thing is, I don't think, I don't think someone is born evil and may, and maybe they are, but just my opinion is I don't think they're born evil. Things may happen. Things may not happen. They may have had it in them and it may, you know, be a rewiring of their brain and maybe they never act on it. Uh, Maybe something triggers their brain and they act on it completely. Maybe, you know, it's simplistic, but hurt people end up hurting people. So I don't, the thing is, I don't care. I don't care if Kevin Sweat had a difficult childhood. I don't care about what could have shaped him and and made him a monster. I don't care. There isn't enough things that happen to make you a monster. There's just not enough for me. You, you know, um, pain is inevitable. Suffering is a decision. We're all going to have pain in our lives. We are humans. It's part of the journey. Do you take your pain and inflict it on someone else? No. Do you want to? Sometimes, sure. 
But do you do that? No, you don't, unless you're a narcissist. And I, w- I really wanted to believe that Kevin Sweat had something wrong, that he had, you know, uh, been hit in the head, uh, that he had, you know, um, lacked oxygen as a, as a child for a certain amount of time that made something bad happen. I really wanted, wanted that. It wouldn't have been an excuse. I wouldn't have let him off the hook. But I wanted something to prove to me what could make someone evil, and there isn't anything. So the quote-unquote motive, which is, of course, what law enforcement is going to be looking for, the motive that Mark, producer Mark said makes the most sense is that his girlfriend knew what, was, what had happened and she was going to tell. And the motive for killing Taylor and Skyla is that in a small, small, small town, everyone knows each other. And in a small, small town, you don't have a lot to do. And we have seen that things like the opioid epidemic has become overwhelming in small towns where maybe it's pain or maybe it's boredom. I, I, you, you want out of your situation? I don't, I don't really know because I was really boring in Independence, Kentucky and never wanted to leave. I thought I would live and die in Northern Kentucky. I really never saw myself in California ever. I, and I didn't even like to travel. <laughs> I, I, I was happy where I was and things change and you go and you move. But in a small town, the placards were next door neighbors to the sweats. So when Kevin Sweat says, I don't know Taylor Placker, her family, Kevin Sweat's brother, Brian, had overdosed in 2007. He was uh, an inveterate drug user, and apparently Taylor Placker's older brother sold drugs. So Kevin Sweat said in retaliation for Taylor Placker's brother selling his brother, Brian Sweat, the drugs that eventually killed him that he OD'd on, he then, you know, kills... Taylor Placker and her friend Skyla. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that that makes that makes all the sense, you know, in the world. Being angry with a drug dealer, completely understandable. If a family member or loved one dies from an overdose that they got from a drug dealer, completely understandable that you would want the same thing to happen to them, or at least you would want them to be incarcerated so that no one else dies from what they're selling. But killing, slaughtering, assassinating two beautiful young girls who who did zero wrong, did nothing wrong. I, I am not even sure Kevin Sweat knew that it was Taylor Placker he was murdering. I, I don't even, right. oh, you know? Yeah, exactly. I really don't, I really don't know that. But Kevin Sweat is not going to give up in his quest for fame he signs something called a blind plea. And he said he didn't know what it entailed, but his quid pro quo was that he got to speak to the FBI on what he said were uh, other crimes that had gone unsolved. <laughs> not oh my, not oh. crimes he had committed, <laughs> crimes against him. <laughs> oh my God. So he gets his time with the FBI and apparently obviously nothing is said about what interacted between them, but either they were not impressed with what he said or he was not happy with the meeting. So when it comes time for, he he did waive his, his right to a jury trial. It saves a lot of money for taxpayers. It saves a lot of time. It's already been, you know, the years have been drawn out. Um, It's six years after the two girls were, assassinated and it's three years after Ashley was murdered somehow we don't know and and burned in a burn pile and you know those classic pictures like um Lee Harvey Oswald being shot by Jack Ruby and oh yeah you know there's this picture and it it isn't going to be as classic as that but it I, I I love this picture so every time that 
Ke- Kevin Sweat is brought into the court. He has on a bulletproof vest. He, you know, he is so hated in this area. And this, like I said, this this became the biggest comprehensive investigation in Oklahoma history. Think about that. That's huge. So here in 2014, <laughs> he is being led into court for his um, sentencing. <laughs> And his defense attorney, Wayne Woodyard, is in front of him. And he's got on a bulletproof vest and he's got his finger out. He's being he's being escorted by deputies, but he's not cuffed or he has no ankle cuffs or, or anything on his hands. And he's got his finger out of his of his right hand. He's pointing at the back of his defense attorney who is in front of him. And shortly after that picture was taken, he had secreted a um, safety razor on his person and took a swipe at his, uh, defense attorney and cut his neck. Oh my God. And it was, you know, not deep, but he was bleeding and they had to take him away. So they take, um, they take Kevin Sweat into another room. They strip him, redress him and bring him back into court. His, uh, an an associate for his defense attorney (laughs) It shows up as opposed to the defense attorney who Christ on a crutch. Was Unbelievable. Having, having his wound tended to. It was not life threatening. Everything's fine. But my favorite part is that by the time an hour later, so the the uh, sentencing is only delayed by one hour because of his ridiculous antics. And an hour later, he shows up in court and he has a what looks like a very swollen, broken nose and a Band-Aid over it because his attorney, who was quite a bit taller than him, when he swiped at his neck, his head thrusted back and hit Kevin in the nose. (laughs) That's the only joy I have is that while he's attempting to, and he says, oh, it was never my intention to, to kill my attorney. It was to bring attention to um, the wrongdoings of the Oklahoma, you know, State Bureau of Investigations, the FBI, all these other crimes. And so he took it out on his defense attorney. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, that, he, what that he said makes was perfect sense. <laughs> what he said was that he wanted he wanted to draw attention to these crimes by doing something a grand statement. So he, you know, attempts to cut his defense attorney in the neck at the sentencing. He wants to withdraw his plea. Uh, can he do that? I don't think he can, can he? Right. That's one of the things I love about you is that you know about the legal system. So he says, I want to withdraw my plea. So the associate to uh, Wayne Woodyard, uh, Kevin Sweat's defense attorney, hands the judge <laughs> a uh piece of yellow legal pad with handwritten with four sentences from Kevin Sweat, who says, I'm withdrawing my plea because the primary reason I entered my plea was to speak to the FBI about possible crimes committed by the OSBI. And because of the FBI's lack of findings, I want to withdraw. The FBI was the only reason I entered this blind plea because they didn't want to get involved with my case, but now they aren't even able to discover anything. Plus, people indicating their statements are being twisted. If the state is so confident in this case, then they've got nothing to worry about. Okay. That was his statement to um, to the judge. And the judge says... Okay, uh, do you want to withdraw your plea? And he says, yes, I do. And the judge goes, yeah, uh, no, it's not happening. Basically, he said that. Basically, like, yeah, you can't do that. Fuck off. So the judge, you know, does not, and, and, and that was going to be appealed afterwards. But during his sentencing, and God bless Mike Taylor, who is Taylor Placker's father, he was at every day in court for the trial. He is an EMT. Uh, He missed one day in court, and that was because he had to finish a 48-hour shift. But he was there every day but one day due to work. He wouldn't miss one minute of the trial of his daughter's killer. And he, you know, lived next door, so he knew Kevin Sweat, and he said he would look at him and growl at him. 
and he would never make eye contact. He would never look at anyone else. So the judge says, uh, Mr. Sweat, it's judgment day, and you are getting three life sentences without the possibility of parole for each murder, and these sentences will run consecutively. And after he read each guilty verdict and the sentence, the courtroom exploded in applause, and he did nothing to stop it. Really? Nothing, which is very rare. Very rare. And at the end, when he said, this is judgment day, he held up his hand after the applause had gone on for a long time. He held up his hand to halt the applause and said, this is judgment day. It's, I mean, I, when we talk about evil, I don't, I don't even think this is evil. I just think it's ignorant. I mean, it's, it's, the acts are evil for sure. I don't think Kevin Sweat's smart enough to be evil. I think he is a real sick narcissist. And I think he wanted to be thought of as something bigger than he was. The guy who worked at McDonald's and worked at Subway and had the girlfriend from high school who he decided he didn't like anymore. He wanted something bigger. He apparently talked to Department of Corrections uh, employees about him wanting to be the Green River Killer. Anyone who aspires to kill over 50 women... Anyone who thinks like that, it's, 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 to me, it's different than the word evil. It's different than evil. I don't, I don't have the right word, and I apologize if it sounds like I'm giving him some sort of um, a pass, because I promise you, I am, I, am not, I am not giving him a pass for everything that he did, which really could be under the heading evil. I just think there's something else. It's it can't just be evil. It has there there has to be evil is too simple. Evil is too simple of a word for him. And Skyla's mother said, I had wanted to hear an apology, but that wouldn't make anything better. I had wanted him to get the death penalty, but that would let him off easy. So she was peaceful with the fact that he was given life without the possibility of parole. And he was a young man. He was 28 at the time. So he has a long time. Unless, as Skyla's mother said, I hope he gets some inside justice. <laughs> Which might happen when people find out you've murdered two young girls and your fiancé. Yeah, the uh, child murderers do not fare well in prison. Yeah, let's hope so. And the, I, the only thing I can do is come back to the quotes that give me some sort of peace. And the quote from J.C. Dugard, this isn't who they are. It's just what happened to them. And these two beautiful girls inspired people from other states. A man came from Ohio and built a memorial garden outside their elementary school. A woman from Arkansas brought a bird bath to put in the memorial garden. It's, they have, they have inspired people to do things. A local author wrote a book about a turtle because Taylor and Skyla like to rescue turtles from their country road and get them out of the way so they wouldn't be run over. They had an, an affinity for turtles. So there's a book in the library that's about them, whether people know it's about them or not. A beautiful children's book that is read quite often by a librarian who says, there's no college course that can prepare you to read a book to other children about two murdered children. There is no college course that prepares you for that. But God bless these two girls who have inspired people to do something that's lasting, a memorial garden, a, a children's book, 
And this is not who they are. It's what happened to them. And more cowbell. And remember, if you'd like to support the podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash just the tipsters.